Upheaval, Reckoning, Chapter 55, The Old Kingdom When the Old Kingdom Council started creating tributary projects in preparation for the coming of Oceanus, the Earth Pony faction focused their efforts on what would be their mightiest creation, the Cold Steel Construct. The companion Smart Cookie led the project, having been already known for her many similar creations. Each step that the thing took sent ominous shudders across the earth. Its enormous metal plates gleamed against the sunlight while the hundreds of crystalline fragments embedded into them glittered. Underneath the armor, great striations like giant exposed muscle could be seen. The cold steel construct was big enough to be at eye level with the siege tower. If the thing had eyes. Where its face should be, there was only a glittering metal plate. The design and specifics were smart cookies, but labor and materials were provided for by Puddinghead. According to translated documents, several mines had to be shut down and all their supplies of raw disruptor crystal were confiscated. An Ospony clan was left completely destitute by this resource drain. Puddinghead's clan was quick to sell them to platinum for additional coin necessary to forge the massive cold steel parts needed for the construct. The first and second wave of legion balls swarmed the cold steel construct like a swarm of hornets, and had the same effect as hornets attacking an anvil. Great bolts of magic, from lightning to fire to rock concussive telekinesis followed. The thing did not even slow its ponderous gait, taking the magical pounding with neither dent nor scratch. Several ballistae fired, but their bolts shattered and fell away. Unlike the Pegasus tributary project, the Cold Steel Construct was never used in actual combat. It was hidden away within the capital and was lost when Oceanus' embrace was activated. The decision not to use it against our forces gives credence to the motion that the six companions already understood, that the battle was lost and were preparing to seal themselves away until Oceanus awakened. With the seals around the Old Kingdom already in place, it is impossible to verify its state or the state of the other constructs that Smart Cookie designed. Luna dearly wanted to join in. She knew that she could prevent a great many deaths if she lent her strength to the Legion for this encounter. The sight of the tributary project also ignited a trembling sense of rage. The firstborn didn't deserve so much as a spit in his direction, let alone a towering behemoth of metal and gems powered by something more despicable than what it hinted at. She wanted to wrench every plate from this thing, turn it into a pile of junk so twisted that even its makers wouldn't be able to make sense of what it was supposed to be. She wanted to tear down the rest of the old kingdom brick by brick, let no reminder of a time when Oceanus was welcome anywhere remain. I will call you to my side. Not one thing. The old kingdom's broken gates beckoned, however. Smaller constructs emerged from the depths of the ruin. Their plating looked more fragile and used more sparingly, exposing coils and wires and sets of gears like mechanical guts. Some were pony-shaped, others more bizarre in their design, as if torn straight out of whatever feverish nightmares that plagued Smart Cookie. One had the top half of a pony mounted on a set of five spidery legs. Another resembled a squid that dragged itself along drill-tipped tentacles. None of them noticed the small group of silent, invisible ponies sidling past them and into the ruins. Luna grit her teeth as the sound of battle grew louder behind her. Blue Moon's reasoning was sound. They needed to push farther in. The Legion would have to deal with this. Though her spell kept the group invisible to other observers, it didn't keep them invisible to each other. Anxiety also gripped her sister and her friends. They also felt the urge to stay and fight. Applejack looked ready to bolt. Rainbow Dash also restlessly glanced back to the fray from time to time. Pinkie Pie kept her head low and her gaze forward. Rarity simply walked ahead grimly. It was Twilight Sparkle and Fluttershy who seemed intent on going deeper into the ruins. There were other concerns as well. As Luna moved closer and closer to such a great concentration of the Firstborn's power, a revolting sense of elation welled from within. There was a hurry in her steps she struggled to get rid of. She shook her hoofs as if the anxiety was some kind of muck clinging to her. It didn't help. 
All it did was elicit a worried glance from her sister. Luna couldn't answer that glance. This wasn't the time to bring out her situation. What would happen if she did? Would they offer their support? Would they even trust her when they were plunging deep into the old kingdom? Her brother promised that he would not allow Oceanus to have anything, but Harada was missing, seemingly swallowed whole by the power he promised he would stop. If Tarado could not hold back the power of Abyss, what could she? Luna. Celestia's soft tone, barely even a whisper, snapped Luna out of her downward spiraling reverie. Celestia walked by her side. The worried glance had turned into a concerned stare. Are you still tired, little sister? I could lend you some strength. Luna shook her head. No, she said just as softly. I've recovered enough. I'll be fine so long as no pony starts losing limbs. The last part had been meant only as some form of measurement. As soon as she said it, however, she winced when the others glanced at the bloody handkerchief wrapped around Fluttershy's face. Fluttershy didn't seem to notice. If she did, she showed no signs of cringing at the attention. She looked more intent on studying the surroundings. Luna could sympathize with that. They were surrounded by a monument to firstborn. They had to focus on orienting themselves and getting used to its appearance. A strange atmosphere surrounded the entirety of the old kingdom. Descending the crater was like slipping through a thin veil of water. Above, the cloudy winter sky looked to be clearing up. More sunlight filtered through the clouds. It barely mattered here. Whatever presence they had entered muted the light that hit the ruins. It was no fog of darkness, but the shadows thrown by the many ruined structures seemed to ripple slightly. Luna had to squint just to get some details around the place. It was as if everything was just ever so slightly out of focus. Then the smell. The smell was horrid and it belied the sterile look of the place. There wasn't a patch of mold or a piece of rotting flesh in sight, but the cloying, lingering traces of decay hung heavily on the air. Luna didn't dare take a deep breath, fearing that taking so much of this foul air at once would corrode her lungs beyond any healing. The group quickly moved away from the main road that led through the gates of the old kingdom. A steady stream of clanking, whining and grinding metal flooded the main road as more and more monstrosities fed the growing battle between the Legion and the Old Kingdom's mechanical reserves. They sidled through a passageway between two broken buildings and hunkered down. What now? Rainbow asked. The strain in her voice, a product of having to move so carefully and hold back her enthusiasm, was evident. Where should we go? Down is the most obvious answer, Celestia said. Remember that the old kingdom was built over the blasphemous rift, and the heart of the rift contains the fall weapon. We must keep going down. She looked over to Twilight, whose eyebrows had furrowed in deep thought. Twilight? Something that I read about this place, Twilight said. If I recall correctly, we need to find a tower. Translations from some Old Kingdom text said that the Six Companions discovered an existing structure before construction of this place even began. They supposedly used it to ascend the depths to the abyss. Her eyes narrowed further. It was also written that none of them managed to complete the journey, so they guarded it jealously. Ascend the depths? Rarity asked. Talk about bad grammar. Was Exarius turning into Discord by the time this translation was made? Applejack rolled her eyes. Sure, let's chalk it up to the list of bad things you did. Went on sign, spread chaos, and had bad grammar. She tucked at her chain. Anyway, let's go find this tower. I don't want to spend any moment longer than we have to here. This place gives me the creeps. What's with all those weird roots designs all over the buildings? They look so nasty. They aren't roots, Twilight said. She put a hoof against one side of a building and traced the building's design that Applejack was talking about. All the walls and great portions of the streets of the Old Kingdom had long, coiling tentacles built into the stonework. Some were not thicker than a foreleg, others around the same size as an oak's trunk. It looked as if the city played host to the roots of a gigantic tree or was infested with thousands of enormous worms. They're the tentacles of Oceanus. They're built all over the old kingdom, from the plaza and courtyards to the houses. Even the smallest bathroom or bedroom has at least one. 
They were supposed to represent that, from the most public to the most private affairs, the will of the Deep Father held sway. Disgusting, Rarity said with a shudder. Garish, too. Why would any pony want to live in a house that looked like it was about to be dragged away by a squid? I don't know, Pinky said. She pressed her front hoofs against her eyes and let out a moan. But it's kind of hurting my eyes and my brain. You're being oppressed, Celestia said. Every pony turned towards her. There's more to the old kingdom's design than mere aesthetics. Focus, my little ponies. We are not going on a little tour. The moment we entered those gates, we had already started fighting against this place. They huddled together after that. Rainbow Dash flew up, trying to ascend to a high enough point without drawing any attention. A moment later, she flew back down to them. I don't see any tower, she said. If there is one, it's probably destroyed. Big Sister, what about your location spell? Luna asked. The golden brilliance radiating from Celestia's horn held the stifling atmosphere at bay for a bit. Not much better, she said. The power of abyss is so sick here, using my magic is like trying to keep a torch lit in a blizzard. To make matters worse, this place is under a powerful dimensional lock. I do not know if it's a function of the power of abyss or a remnant of Lexarius' seal. She stared at Luna. Did it trouble you as much to maintain those stealth spells? Luna shook her head. No, I would guess that the power of abyss has a particular distaste for the power of sunlight. Celestia turned towards Twilight. You've seen the maps of this place, haven't you? she asked. Twilight nodded. Not just seen, your highness, memorized. The pride was unmistakable in her tone. I know where the tower to the abyss should be. Good. Celestia mirrored that pride with a smile. We will need that. No doubt these side streets would have been confusing enough during the Old Kingdom's height. The decay and the stagnation of the power of abyss here would have made things worse. Worse? Luna asked. What do you mean, big sister? Do you mean the damage caused by flooding and the poor lighting? Not just that, Celestia said. You were not there during the immediate aftermath of the Firstborn's Rebellion. Great sections of Imperia were warped by the passage of the power of abyss. If the six companions were toying with even the lingering presence of it, we should expect oddities. She looked to Twilight and her friends. Do not let our attention linger too long on the architecture. Remember that the power of abyss can and will hurt you in ways you may not expect. We'll be ready, Twilight said. As they resumed moving through the side street, Celestia's horn continued to glow. Her persistent location combined with the knowledge Twilight had gleaned should have a sure pass to their goal despite the warping of this place. Now that they were away from the main road, it also became clear that whatever was muting the light had a similar effect on sound. While they had no problem hearing each other, the whining and grinding sounds of metal against stone quickly faded into faint scratching, even though they haven't walked that far. Far from being serene, the silence of the old kingdom only served to emphasize the unnerving sounds that reached them. Faint whispers drifted through the stale air. The words, when they could be made out, made no sense in either equestrian or old kingdom. It wasn't just whispers either. An out-of-place hoofstep, the creak of a door swinging, a light clink of some small metal ring landing somewhere. Once in a while they could be heard always brief and at a distance, always dancing between being imagined and actually hurt. They were on a very slight downward slope. The old kingdom was built like a massive crater. The entrance was along the very edges of it and the central plaza was close to the very center. The side streets were warped as Celestia had predicted, some in the most bizarre ways. They didn't always travel on a flat surface. Sometimes the streets curved or distorted like a crumbled ribbon. Shadowy doorways or ruined buildings beckoned entry only to disappear when looked at again. A distant light sometimes appeared in some of the windows. They flickered and vanished around the peripheries. A few times the warping was so confusing that Twilight paused for minutes trying to piece together enough clues to where to go next. They approached the central plaza. Around it should be the three faction buildings of the Old Kingdom. 
the palace of Princess Platinum, which also served as Clover the Clever's library, the laboratory and headquarters of Commander Hurricane and Pansy, and the earthworks of Smart Cookie and Puddinghead. From a distance it looked like none of them had survived. Cracks and small potholes pockmarked the grey-green stone pavement they walked on. The surface had the sheen of dampness everywhere. Small puddles of water collected in the indentures, although these did not have the mirror-like finish of the lake. The stone was cold, unnaturally so. Despite her silver, hurt forged shoes, Luna shivered. The walls were just as bad. It's kinda weird that this place is so clean, Rainbow Dash said. She was the only pony flying around and the draft from her wings blew more of the foul, cold air towards Luna's face. She didn't chastise the Pegasus, however. Rainbow Dash looked restless and uneasy. If flying helped with that, then Luna didn't mind. I thought there'd be more dead bodies around. Rainbow Dash? Rarity snapped. That's distasteful. Hey, it's not like I want more dead bodies around. Remember Clover the Clever's Refuge? It had a bunch of dead bodies floating around even after hundreds of years. Her voice lowered. I'm just wondering what happened to all the ponies who lived here if their city just got swallowed by a lake, it's all. Don't drink that sugar cube, Applejack said. She glanced towards the darkened entrances to the many ruined buildings around them. We just might find out. M maybe, Pinkie Pie whimpered. The others looked to where she was pointing. Maybe they all got washed down there. The side streets they were following split in two, one which led to the main plaza while the other continued to wind into a vertebral maze of ruins. The plaza was not infested with Smart Cookie's monstrosities, much to their relief. It seemed that the horrible constructs that were attacking the Legion were coming from some place else. Indeed, the plaza was bereft of anything save for a wide flat space and a hole around a couple dozen feet across. The tentacles of Oceanus swirled around the hole and down it. From their spot it was difficult to tell if a great many of the things were wiggling in or wiggling out. Six petals still surrounded the hole symmetrically. All were nearly completely destroyed. One still had a large fragment of the statue sitting on it intact. It looked like the hind legs of a pony rearing up and over the hole. While the sight proved disturbing enough, the sounds near the place was worse. There were ponies crying, the distant whimpers of a hurt foal, and the stifling sobs of older ponies. It was impossible to focus on them. The sounds had a life of their own, drifting to the periphery whenever some pony tried to listen better. What is that? Rainbow asked. Some kind of well? Celestia's eyes narrowed. She already knew what it was, as did Luna. Neither of them wanted to explain. When the other bearers looked to Twilight Sparkle, they knew one was coming anyway. Not a well, Twilight said. A pit. If that's the main plaza, then that would be the pit of rejects. Re rejected what? Pinkie Pie said. The six companions wanted their everlasting kingdom to be perfect, Twilight said. She kicked aside a piece of rubble and stared at the pit in disgust. That included the residents. Every foal born had to pass stringent qualifications. Those that failed, well, they were rejected. Rarity swallowed. Rejected as in, they were thrown down there? Twilight looked towards the side streets. The parents were expected to spend the next three days begging for forgiveness and promising to do better. Let's go, girls. The tower should be just a little way off now that we've reached this point. If you don't mind, I don't want to pass that way. No pony said anything, but they did take the other street. The gentle sobbing faded as they put the forsaken pit behind them. Wait, are heading for that weird dome? Rainbow Dash asked. She no longer needed to put in so much effort in keeping her voice subdued. Even her wing beats slowed just to keep from making too much noise. I thought we were looking for a tower. The maps I read all point to that spot as a place for the tower to the abyss, Twilight said. I know it doesn't look like a tower, but I don't think we should be relying on looking when it comes things like the abyss. They skirted around the main plaza, past the wreckage of the three main buildings of the old kingdom. Nearly nothing had been left of the three buildings. Perhaps it was better that way. 
The dome-shaped structure, however, was mostly intact. Its walls had a glossy white finish, smooth as worked marble and easily distinguished from the grey-green stone that comprised the rest of the city. Not only that, there were no signs of cracking anywhere around it. The entrance was a doorway that would have allowed a fully grown dragon through. Hoofsteps echoed throughout the empty building when they entered. The floor inside was spotless and as white as the outer walls. The space was uncluttered as well. If this was some other city in Equestria, Luna would have assumed that this was a parading ground or a place of gathering. She looked to the ceiling. There might be something that could clue them in on what this so-called Tower to the Abyss really was. They certainly were not doing any climbing or descending in this emptiness. She looked up and gasped. The ceiling was also white and partially luminescent. Despite the dark atmosphere of the Old Kingdom, they could see much better here, enough to clearly make out the incredible detail on the murals above them. The face of Oceanus stared at them from the very center of the building. At least, it was a depiction of Oceanus's face. Luna was already sure that the firstborn was not black, nor did he have a wriggling mass of tentacles for a mane. The sights depicted scenes from what she could guess was a history of the Old Kingdom. Three separate nations were shown at one part, a city above the clouds, a grand castle high in the mountains and villages across a wide plain. A little to the right showed the same nations surrounded by six great pony shapes of swirling whites and blues. The windy goes, Twilight Sparkle said softly as she stared at the same part of the mural. This must be the starting point. The Windigos were the ones that forced the early ponies to seek the power of Oceanus. Actelos, Fluttershy said. She was also staring at that part of the mural. Minaros, Costis, Manitis, Erbos, and Lockhorus. Every pony stared at Fluttershy. Twilight's jaw dropped while the others looked with concern. Fluttershy, how do you know those names? Twilight asked. For a moment, Fluttershy didn't even seem to hear them. She continued to look at that particular section of the mural, as if she was looking at an old family photograph. Fluttershy? Celestia asked. Huh? Fluttershy turned around and winced when she saw them all staring at her. How do you know all those names? Celestia asked. Well, um... Fluttershy pawed the floor nervously. I... I don't really know. I must have read some of one of those books in Canterlot, I think. What else do you know about them? No suspicion marked Celestia's voice. Indeed, she sounded genuinely interested as if Fluttershy brought up a fun little topic at a tea party. Luna wondered if her sister suddenly decided to pick this time to show off how well she could lie or if she meant every word. The effect was immediate. Fluttershy relaxed and went back to looking at the mural. Well, she said, they were friends, I think. They were a small group within the Equus de Abusso. When Regia Carnifex left, they started thinking that they didn't want to serve as well. So they, they severed the tie. Luna looked to her sister. Enforcers cutting off their tie? She asked incredulously. Is this even possible? The bond between an Alicorn summoner and his or her enforcers is tightly knit, sometimes to the point where even they find it difficult to determine where they begin and end, Celestia replied. I've never seen it happen or even heard of such a thing. Still, I imagine that it is possible. Ultimately, enforcers can make their own decisions if concerned in such a way, and I'm sure Oceanus' actions were extreme enough to give even some of his enforcers pause. But I've never heard of enforcers going around without an alicorn, Luna said. What would have happened to them? Let's ask, shall we? Celestia looked back to Fluttershy. What happened then? The pain was... It was unbearable. Fluttershy pressed a hoof against her ruined eye. They went blind with it, turned their rage on everything around them. Her gaze went from the scene where the Windigo surrounded the three nations to where they were chasing a large group of ponies. Blue-white swirls had tangled a few of the fleeing ponies. 
the next scene showed six ponies wreathed in blackness, the six companions, standing against the Windigos. They lost in the end. Fluttershy, I'm definitely sure there's no way you could have read that somewhere, Twilight said. Fluttershy looked blankly at Twilight and then to the rest of her concerned friends. Isn't there? she asked. I mean, where else would I have found out? Twilight's eyes narrowed. You sounded like you were there, like you knew each of those Windigos, like you felt their pain. Fluttershy shrank from Twilight and looked away. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know how I know. Sugar Cube, are you okay? Applejack asked. You've been acting mighty strange since, well, since you got... Hammer to a pulp, Rainbow said. She ignored the glass shot her way. What gives, Fluttershy? You're creeping us out with a scary eye-blasting and this story lesson from nowhere. Fluttershy dropped to a low crouch, pressing a hoof against her ruined eye even harder. I don't know. I don't... A white feathered wing draped over Fluttershy. Hush, Fluttershy. Celestia said. I believe you. Big sister, do you know what's going on? Luna asked. She hoped that the answer was a definite yes. Being attended to by enforcers was no common gift among alicorns and knowledge about them, despite the eternal herd's long history, was scarce. Even the enforcers themselves had little self-knowledge and they had never been inclined to discover.